and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. Coming up on the show, L.A. Noir is finally here, and so is our review. You have any preference regarding rope, Eli? I know a good rope from a bad rope, if that's what you mean. That's not what you mean, is it? And now that we've given it a good run, we hand down our verdict on the team-based shooter, Brink. Also, we catch up with Australia's very own iRacing champion. But first, can you guess the game for this week? Now, this week, this one-of-a-kind rare good game t-shirt could be yours. It was a colour that we were trying and then we thought it looked crap, so we thought we'd give it away as a prize. Mm. Mm. It's nice material, though. Yeah. Mm. Can I try that on? Yeah, sure. Ah! Oh. <laughs> I was gonna read the news. Good game! Just as the PlayStation Network began to resume services, IDOS has become the latest victim of a cyber attack, which targeted the official IDOS.com and Deus Ex Human Revolution sites. An official statement confirmed 25,000 user email addresses, along with 350 resumes, were stolen in the attack. No credit card information or address details were stored on their site. Medieval fantasy MMO Lineage will be shutting down permanently in Western Territories on June 29th. The developers and Seasoft have stated the move is due to the game, which was first released in 1998, no longer being financially viable in Western markets. All Lineage accounts are now free to play until the shutdown and any unused game time will be refunded. Playdom, an American social games studio within the Disney Interactive Media Group, has been fined approximately $3 million for breaching the Child Online Privacy Protection Act. The offending game was the since discontinued title Pony Stars, which collected and published the ages and email addresses of over 800,000 users without parental consent. Jason Citron, the 26-year-old creator and CEO of popular social mobile gaming platform OpenFaint, has sold the company for approximately $100 million. The sale was made to Japanese social gaming company Gree Inc. and comes just over two years since OpenFaint first debuted in February 2009. It now boasts over 100 million users. Good game. From the makers of the excellent enemy territory and the not-too-bad Quake Wars comes Brink. Has been driven to this. The game is set sometime in the not too distant future where the Earth's water level has risen, forcing survivors to take refuge on an island aptly named the Ark. Brothers, if we stay here, we die. To save our people, we must escape the Ark. But too many people and not enough food leads to civil unrest between a resistance movement and a security force both vying for control. It's a decent idea for a story, and you can play either side of the campaign. Developer Splash Damage have said this is a, a blending of multiplayer and single-player gameplay, and that means when you play online, your game will be populated by other people, and bots will fill in the gaps. You can choose to play through the story campaign with cutscenes, or you can just jump into any map online with free play. Uh, playing with the bots in co-op is OK, but you can't really plan with them, which is where a co-op shooter really shines. Yeah, the bosses aren't fun, are they? This this is a multiplayer game. The single-player cutscenes are, are more like bookends uh, on on an actual multiplayer map. Secure the crash site. You see a tango? Make him dead. So they just sit in a boat and chat, and then you fight. We played this on 360 and PC, and there are some major differences. The PC suffers a little bit from consoleitis. You know, this guy's got, got some of those radial menus, and uh, I just felt like it wasn't really optimized for a PC experience. Uh, on the other hand, though, the console version is actually very visually underwhelming. There's jaggies and just rampant texture popping that is very distracting. Looks aside, let's talk about the team based gameplay. There are four player classes a medic who throws a revive syringe and boosts the health of teammates. Soldiers which can destroy objectives, throw molotovs which can knock back enemies, and also supply ammo to teammates. Engineers who can complete repair objectives, repair complete. remove charges and devices, drop mines and turrets, and also buff damage of teammates and yourself. And the operatives who can hack devices and disguise themselves. Sky successful! You and your team need to attack or defend a series of objectives in timed missions as you unlock perks and weapon mods. I thought the engineer was the most fun to play. He just felt like you had more to do as an engineer. Good job, engineer! But as you move through the maps, you'll need to change classes to complete specific objectives. I liked the Medic Revive barge. Every fallen player is incapacitated at first, and they can choose to either wait for a Medic or respawn back at base. When you are thrown a Revive Syringe, though, you can respawn at that spot, but you can also choose when to respawn, which, which can help you avoid a fight. It's risky business, though, because it's so much fun shooting people while they're on the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Half of what makes a class-based shooter like this work are the maps. And you can tell that they've been thought about. You know, there's lots of choke points and, and areas you can see that have been designed to have multiple entries. And I, still, I couldn't help but feel they were too box-like hex, and I didn't really enjoy being in this world. I think the best part about this game are the perks. There's too many really to mention here, but there are some good ones. The ability to unlock a perk that lets you reload while running, or see when someone is targeting you outside your peripherals, or one that gives you a third-person view when planting or hacking to keep watch for incoming enemies. Taking the health command post. Going for the health command post. There are plenty of guns, and each of these are customizable too. But to be able to do that, you'll need to play some of the challenges. There are four types: tower defense, which is a wave mode, objective. Escort, which is the most fun, and a parkour challenge. Brink uses a movement system called Smart, which allows you to leap and move about the place fluidly without a jump button. How much leaping and vaulting you can do depends on your body type, heavy, medium or light. Heavies take more damage, for example, but can't leap about as much. The system is okay, but quite often you'll parkour when you just want to move past an object and that'll get you killed. It's no mirror's edge and it's certainly not going to make you love the game. Congratulations. You have demonstrated your ability to exploit freedom of movement. This skill will prove invaluable in combat. There is a lot of character customization, though. I liked all the different outfits, and there's heaps of customization for the weapons. But I felt like they didn't really have a, a slow enough trickle of those weapons, so you never really got to get used to one before moving on to another. And it took me ages just to work out which one I actually liked. I really liked how the more mods you put on, the more it affects your equip speed. I mean, it's a nifty and punishing stat that you don't really see that often in FPS. I also think there's a huge difference between the PC and the console version as far as the way the game plays, because the zoom on the console isn't great and that means you spam a bit more so stability is a much more important stat. On the PC that's not so much of an issue and it just plays much better. I really liked the health bars above enemies' heads and the class icons that let you know who needed your help. I was really looking forward to this game, Hex, because there are some talented people working on it but it just doesn't have that charm of Team Fortress 2 and I feel like it hasn't really evolved enough from Enemy Territory and Quake Wars which has similar ideas. Also, along with the connection issues we had with the PC version, it's just a bit too expensive for what the game is, because it is just a multiplayer game. So I'm giving it five and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Well, I think it does grow on you, but if you're not playing with friends and you get a bad group, then it can be pretty frustrating. I think if the lag and sound bug issues are fixed, then I might feel differently about it, but for now it's a straight five from me. Well, Barjo, it's time to pull some questions out of the old inbox and put them on the TV. And let's start with this Chibo hunting question from Alex in Port Macquarie, New South Wales. Hi. I'm trying to get the Overclocker achievement in Portal 2, where you have to complete Test Chamber 10 in 70 seconds. Any hints? Smile. P.S. Love the show. Well, Alex, just follow these steps and you should be able to get it without much of a struggle. Now, as soon as you walk into the chamber, turn around and put a portal high on the wall above the entrance. Make sure you keep running towards the hole and drop your other portal at the bottom of it. Jump down and fly through to get the cube. Then drop back down into the hole and slowly drop through your portal. Then run to the aerial faith plate and jump on. Then drop your cube in front of the laser and shoot a portal onto the opposite wall. Run back down to the aerial faith plate and fly up to the top level and quickly put your other portal on this wall. Push the button quickly and wait for the other cube to fly up. Catch it, then drop down to level two and quickly swap the cubes, making sure to line the laser up with your portal. Drop back down to the faith plate with the cube in hand and quickly put it on the button and bam, Chivo unlocked. Well, you passed the test. All right, well, good luck with that, Alex. But now let's move on to this one from Daniel in Wonthaggy, Victoria. I've been trying to find a good hack and slash game for ages. I've played God of War, Dante's Inferno and Darksiders and I want something else. Any ideas? Well, Daniel, you've mentioned a few games that are really quite similar to each other, so if you're really after something that's in that vein, the first one that springs to mind for me would be Heavenly Sword. I I've always described that as God of War with a chick. 
I'd also recommend Castlevania. It has a, a decent length, and despite some level design issues, it's actually a really fun ride. Other than that, I guess if you wanted to broaden your horizons, uh, you might want to try X-Men Origins Wolverine. Or Uncharted, definitely. I mean, that's a shooter, but it's such a great action-adventure game and, and quite possibly one of the best games I've ever played, I think. Mm. And would you say Enslaved as well? It's kind of hack and slash in a way. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's really on par in terms of um, epicness and difficulty mm. with, with God of War, but, I mean, if you like good action-adventure, again, it's a great one. I would also try Muscle March. <laughs> nice muscle! Well, those should keep you busy for a little while, Daniel. Next, we have this one from Air Raptor in Perth, Western Australia. Hey, Hex, Marjo. I always have an argument with my friends about Halo that usually ends in senseless violence. So in Halo, Gravity Hammer versus Energy Sword, which wins? I say Gravity Hammer as it has more attack radius, but my friends all say Energy Sword. Mm, well, there's only one way to answer that Air Raptor, and that's by testing with science. Well, there you have it, and you can't argue with science. No, you can't. And with that, we're out of time for this week. As always, if you have any questions for us, you can send them in here. Good game. And Mitchell McLeod wins the online B8 Supercar Championship. Hi, I'm Mitchell McLeod, and I'm one of the best sim racers in the world. I got into sim racing about five years ago when a friend of mine got me into Live for Speed. At the time I was racing go-karts, so I thought that was pretty cool to race my friends on there when I'm at home. Started racing go-karts when I was about 14 years old. I actually won the Golden Power Series, which is a series around Victoria. I won that two years in a row, so um, that's probably one of my highlights of the event. Already McLeod goes up the inside. He can give as good as he takes as well. And also the Australasian kart titles. I won that as well a couple times in a row. Once I racing come out, it was about the same time I got out of go-karting. iRacing's basically an online racing simulator. It's probably one of the most accurate ones there is out at the moment. Um, all the tracks are laser scanned, so they're within, I think they're within a millimetre perfect of the real life track. There's quite a big range of different cars and tracks you can race on. It's all about racing hard, racing clean, and um, yeah, some of the racing on there that I've had has been as good as I had in real life. My success in go-karts probably helped me a little bit in uh, eye racing. It's uh, a little bit different. You can't feel the car moving around or anything like that. So you sort of have to learn a few things again, and it takes you a little while to get back up to speed. But um, I think once you get the hang of that, you can transfer those skills over from real life racing to eye racing. At the moment, I've achieved, um, there was a GP series, and it was three regions throughout the world. There was European, and American, and the Asia Pacific. And um, the top two Australians got to go over to Hanover in Germany to compete over there against eight other guys. And I was lucky enough to get second in that Australian qualifying race, and um, got flown over to Germany to compete against eight of the top guys on the sim racing at the moment in the world. Mitchell McLeod would make a run on the inside of four, forcing Gooden to maintain the low line out of five as McLeod goes by for sixth place. Yeah, it was pretty an amazing experience to go over there for sim racing when, you know, go-karts, it was sort of a little bit more of a struggle to get anywhere like that. There's also been the V8 Supercar Series, which I've been racing in fairly regularly. And in there, I've just recently won the first series for this year. So yeah, that was fairly competitive as well. So that was really one of my highlights. Last night when I was doing a few laps, just doing a bit of practice for this coming V8 Supercar race, there was a couple of real life V8 Supercar drivers that are trying to make it in the main series and they were on there racing as well. There's quite a lot of guys that get on there. I don't know if it's more for fun than um, practice over here, but um, I know definitely overseas, um, guys like Marcus Ambrose and Dale Earnhardt Jr, they are all online racing, trying to get a bit of practice in, get the edge on the competitors. game itself, I think sim racing is going to go forwards and become sort of its own sport. 
there's a lot of prizes up for grabs now and there's sponsorships coming out because of the publicity it's getting. So um, the plan is to get some sponsorship for my car racing online in the V8 Supercar and then use that money to go towards real life racing and get myself back into racing that way. So that's, that's the plan. first gaming love affair would have to be Double Dragon. I remember playing it um, on Burbong Street in Brisbane. There was a, a convenience store that had Double Dragon and um, my friends and I used to come home from school and go to this convenience store with just a load of 20 cent coins and spend what we thought was a fortune. It was probably only two dollars or something but I just remember every day during school just thinking about getting out and going and playing Double Dragon with my mates. It became kind of that first feeling of an obsession with something um, that I've experienced so many other times subsequently with computer games, but I think that's the first time I experienced that, that almost addiction, you know, I had to get further than I did the previous day. Aussie developer Team Bondi has teamed up with open world experts Rockstar Games to bring us L.A. Noir. For every cop, there's the case that makes you. Gives you that leg up, gets you recognized as a shining new star in the squad. The case that you solve that shows that you have the get up and go to make you stand out from your average rank and file patrolman. This could be the one goal. You sit there and you call me those names, you goddamn goy butt snatcher. Are you gonna give me trouble? So now you're gonna tell me you loved her? Los Angeles. It's a town of glitz, glamour and temptation. It's the late 1940s and the effects of the war are still present. It's a time of violence and corruption and fancy cars. Welcome to Hollywood land, where everyone is a liar and you are the justice that weeds out their selfish and criminal intentions. You play as Cole Phelps, effortlessly played by actor Aaron Staten from Mad Men. Phelps is an up-and-coming Dan Aykroyd sounding detective who plays everything by the book and in our case is also a terrible, terrible driver. Roger, 14 Adam en route. Here we go again. Watch where you're driving, you maniac. Slow and steady, come on. Watch it, will you? Jesus, Phelps. Phelps, if we survive this, it's going to be a miracle. After showing some initiative on the street, your career takes off as you work your way through the ranks, investigating some very grisly murders. What caused the blunt force injury to the face? Could be anything from a baseball bat to a lug wrench. This is purely a single-player detective game, and quite unlike Rockstar's other games such as Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption, hitting people with your car is actually really difficult and you can't punch anyone in the street and you can't even pull out your gun in public. If you're expecting an action-packed, open-world, pimp ladder climbing experience, you're going to be disappointed. Mm. There are lots of actual ladders, though. Hmm. L.A. Noire wants to be taken very seriously and it also wants you to take being an upstanding cop very seriously as well. It'll put you against very cruel characters and dodgy cops to reinforce this. Besides the side missions, this is a completely linear game, but it's a classy story that's told in a very unique way, with some wartime flashbacks thrown in. I'm scared, Sarge. Everybody's scared, kid. Much to our pleasure, it all really works and it's utterly compelling. Naturally, we'll do our best to avoid all spoilers here, but that means we can't show you any of the case conclusions or anything like that, and they're some of the best bits. Mm. This is a long game too, about 35 to 40 hours, including side missions, but it's full of stereotypical but believable and well-rounded characters from the era. There's exciting action, red herrings, and some very adult themes. This game is not for the faint of heart. Yeah, it is quite dark, but I think they've stayed on the right side of that line. Mm. It's not gratuitous, and it shows respect for the darkness of the genre. Kiss the blood, BD. Yeah, I think so. At first glance, you could say that gameplay-wise it's a blend of Heavy Rain and Mafia 2, but it's much better than both of those games. You could also say it's like a sophisticated Phoenix Wright in 3D. Yeah, the main mechanic here is trying to work out whether the person you're talking to is lying to you. That might sound dull, but it's actually really addictive and thrilling and quite tense at times. Investigations will always lead to conversations with witnesses, neighbours, suspects, the older hobo. Huh? 
What? And other persons of interest, and this will almost always lead to a tactical interrogation and sometimes violence. But the most exciting moments are when your suspects flee. I love it when they run, Hex. LAPD, you're under arrest. Hmm? Do not lose that son of a bitch. Very occasionally, a character will say or do something that you already knew or had already been found out somewhere else, but there are very few errors. It only happened a handful of times, and you forgive it because there are so many complex story threads being thrown around here. Mm. You really need to pay attention and check your log and evidence during an investigation, because if you're going to accuse someone of lying, you better have the evidence to back it up, because you'll have to live with the consequences if you don't. I've been around some, son. You got some evidence that proves I stole that butterfly from that woman? We replayed a few cases to see if we could get a different outcome at the end of it, but we found the outcome was the same. It was just a different way of getting there with maybe less XP if you didn't do as well. There is possible long-term consequences or maybe some weird way that we haven't found yet. There's just so many different ways you can investigate, aren't there? Yeah, and as you play, not only does Phelps gain in rank, but you also become a better detective. We can put the driver in front of a judge in less than a week. It's such an achievement that the game makes you really want to work harder at being better at that. You'll start to look for evidence more efficiently, learn how to ask the right questions, and just be better at judging if someone's lying or not. Mm. And pretty soon you learn that everybody lies, from the hardest of criminals to the most innocent of old ladies, and they all have their reasons, and it's finding that reason which is the interesting part to these interrogations. And, and why that works is because of the unsurpassed facial technology used here. They motion captured all the scenes in two parts, the action and the faces, with 32 cameras on a constant 3D close-up. It's very new and exciting technology, and you never tire of these cut scenes. So the guys' names that I've been seeing doing the repairs on the heaters, they're fully licensed and accredited. I think some of your men aren't fully licensed. You're desperate to cover your sales. You can see the veins and necks, wonky teeth, skin crinkles, and the slightest flutter or tell or shifty eyes can give someone away. And this is also you can gauge a person's reaction. Mm, it's incredible, and probably why the 360 version comes on three DVDs. In a question, you have three options, truth, lie, or doubt. And it can be tricky to know when to choose lie or doubt. You really have mm. to listen to the last thing your suspect says. And if you know they're lying, but you can't prove it, then choose doubt, because you might get lucky. Did your wife ever go out by herself? To bars, nightclubs? No. Yeah, it can be confusing. Sometimes I'd find I, I had the evidence that I thought would actually disprove their lie, but for some reason it just didn't work. So I thought they could have explained some of that a little bit better. Maybe I was just being dumb. <laughs> It's quite infuriating because you don't know if you're just not using the evidence right or maybe you just don't even have it, but that's part of the game and you just roll with it. After a few hours in, you're pretty much suspicious of everyone and you develop a permanent case of Susface. <laughs> he doesn't include me in his business. Well, he's suspicious. They trust her to take care of me. Yeah, it can be a challenge to tell who's lying in a town full of actors. Yeah, there's some stellar performances here, aren't there? I, I think that's where most of the polish has gone in this game, and there's a lot of actors that you probably won't place at first, but then you go, oh, yeah, that guy. Do I look like a Rockefeller? Nobody likes a cheapskate, Hugo. Completing side missions and gaining XP from successful interrogations will net you intuition points, which you can spend to narrow down your options in interviews. But when you're not interrogating, you'll be searching for evidence. At first, this feels cumbersome, especially as there's always bottles and cigarette packets that you don't need to investigate. It would take a smarter man than me to connect that. And sometimes you'll think something is nothing, but then you just hadn't turned it over the right way. But you learn to recognise most of the random stuff, and the music will stop playing when you have all of the clues. In fact, music plays a really big part in the game in lots of different ways. Yeah, the searching isn't perfect, is it? But it's pretty good. I, I think it's better than Heavy Rain's searching mechanic, and I think that's a, a reasonable comparison. There's lots of visual clues to help you out as well, but I particularly loved how your partner helps. A detective's partner is important to the feel of this genre, and he has his uses. If you're stumped, you can ask him for advice, or just watch him as he looks at evidence himself and then look at what he was looking looking at. I think your detective partners are so well cast, Hex, especially Galloway, who's this wonderful bastard. It was a loss of the trap, and you just couldn't stand it anymore. Shut your goddamn mouth! <laughs> Though now and then I found that the partners got on the way, like in this dry cleaners. Didn't happen much, but it was frustrating, and I took out my revenge by pretending to let him in the car, but just driving off repeatedly. <laughs> Uh, 
We've been playing the 360 version and the city itself looks about GTA 4 quality, so it's very detailed, especially in all the homes and shops you visit and it's quite pretty at times, but you do get some irritating indestructible fences and hedges. Easy! And even with a hard drive install, you can tell the game is hungry for more power, so frame drops and texture popping take a little bit of the shine off. Yeah, and I thought it was a bit weird too that no matter how you entered an area, the moment it cuts to the cutscene, it's quite different from the action you were last doing, but I, I think they're just cutting the fat, and I didn't mind that. The game will ask you to skip a section if you fail it too much, and there's these great golden handles everywhere, which are a subtle way to let you know if it's a door you can actually interact with. There's no GPS in the late 40s, but pressing X will get your partner to give you directions. Take the next right. And I loved that. Even if he's in the middle of a story, he'll stop, give you a direction, and then continue on. Fantastic. These old cars are just lovely too, aren't they? Car physics aren't completely realistic, but they're very responsive and easy to drive, and it's kind of funny watching them all bump about. Mac, you're gonna kill us! Let's talk about the action, Hex. When you get sick of investigating, you can respond to radio calls, and that'll send you to break up bank heists, small-time robberies, and domestic disputes. There's just something so cool about responding to a call and then chucking an epic U-turn. Now, the gunplay is okay, but the auto-targeting system is a little bit flaky. If you're not already looking directly at an enemy, the reticule will just be all over the place. And the fist fights use the same combat system as GTA 4 and Red Dead, which still feels pretty clumsy. It is quite funny when your hat gets punched off, though. <laughs> and sometimes this happens. <laughs> Hello. What was that again? Oh! It is fun being a cop for a change, though, especially mm. in this period in history when, you know, it's still quite quaint and there's nothing to distract you from that rough gut instinct detectiving. Mm. I don't think you will be out of prison for very long. You can count on it, shit bird. I do have an issue with the way they've structured a, a certain story thing and the reasons why they've done it, and I, I can't talk about it because it would be a complete spoiler, but I'll just have to leave that there and uh. hope that it redeems itself by the end. Final thoughts, Hex. Well, I loved wanting to do better in interviews, so I wish there was a little bit more of a reward for that than just intuition points or outfits. Mm. And I genuinely felt bad when I falsely accused someone of lying. You know, you really feel for these characters. And for a game to evoke that kind of emotional response from you is so rare, and here it happens in like every second scene. I don't know if he intended to leave me or if it was just a fling. God only knows. I only want to know that he's safe. I want more games like this, Bajo. I'm giving it nine and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Yeah, this is quite an accomplishment by Team Bondi and Rockstar. I think they've made something here that is very unique and compelling, and, and it's just new, you know, we haven't really had a game like this. I do wish this was on PC, though, or if it just had a bit more grunt behind it, because I found that some of the performance issues were a bit distracting. Even so, it's been ages since I've had a game that has made me want to pay this much attention to everything that's being said, so I'm giving it nine and a half out of ten rubber chickens. the game for this week. They damaged the truck. It was Enemy Territory, the team-based multiplayer expansion to 2001's Return to Castle Wolfenstein, designed by British studio Splash Damage, the devs behind Brink. Killing spree. So if you would like to win this wonderful exclusive Good Game t-shirt, you know what you have to do? And if you don't, you need to jump on the Good Game forums or the Facebook page or Twitter with hashtag GGTV and plead your case. Next week, we'll be back on the dusty trail with the off-road racing of Dirt 3. And it's RPG time as we take on the monsters and magic of The Witcher 2, Assassins of Kings. Till next time, gamers, may all your health bars regenerate. Hex out. Bunch them out. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm predicting it. It's gonna be amazing.